Hey, guess what? It rained again yesterday, and it rained last night, and it rained this morning, and it's foggy. Wow, I'm amazed. Let's go and see where the cattle are. This is typical. I can hear them, but I can't see them yet. Oh, here they are in the middle field. Oh, what a mess they're making. Man, is it wet. They're scattered all over the place down here, and they're all belly aching. What do you guys want? Uh. Hey, buddy. They're out of pasture. Today is the day when we are officially out of pasture. That's right, Patty, for the year. I guess I'm gonna have to do something about that, but first I wanna take a look at Prudence, our very pregnant cow, who's off by herself over here. That's usually a sign that something's gonna happen. Hiya, Prudence. How are you doing, lady? How are you doing? You're still big and round. Your udder's not blown up yet. You got a poopy tail. She's got a ways to go. They're following me back there, but I got no place to lead them as far as new pasture goes, so I'm gonna get ready to bring them into the winter yard, and that's where they'll be for the next five months or so. First thing I gotta do is set up their stock tank here in the winter pen. What a mess, we've had so much rain. Gosh. I'm gonna need to shim that up. Or maybe I'd be better off digging out the back side so it levels up. I'm gonna do that instead. I've showed this little trick before, but I'll show it again. These, what I call a D-clip, carabiner clip, I guess. They aren't very strong when they're stretched this way, they tend to come loose. So I have a different way of hooking them up that another farmer taught me, and it is you wrap the chain around, and then when you have it tight, you put one link through another link like this, and then you put the clip on like this, and that's a very strong connection now. Works good. Next I have to put my calf board on to keep the calves from getting out from under the gates. When the bedding pack builds up, they can't get out anymore, but for now when it's empty, an extra board. Next, I gotta hook up the float valve to it. Oh, we don't wanna do that. We wanna do this. And while that tank's filling, I gotta move the Super A out of here. Oh, geez, one of the pigs got zipped by the fence. Gotta move Super A out of here so that we can put a round bale in against this feeder panel. And the Super A still starts with the old Armstrong crank system. The battery's been dead in it for about three years now. I don't know, no big deal. I just crank start it. If I get my act together, I'm not gonna use this to plow snow this winter anyway. I'm gonna use the 656 with a plow blade on it, but first dad and I gotta fabricate a mount for the plow blade and a swivel. Driving that little Supra is like driving a go-kart. This hay that I have stacked in here we're using for pig bedding, and one way I found to protect it from getting eaten by the cows is to just put these pieces of plywood in front of it so they can't get at it. While the weather's warm, I'll just run the float valve on this stock tank, and I won't have to worry about keeping it full but when the weather freezes up, I'll wind up running a hose every day to the stock tank from this hydrant over here. And then when I'm done, I drain the hose so it doesn't freeze up. I could put a hydrant at the tank, but in a way I like having to fill it manually twice a day because standing there and filling it forces me 
to watch the cows for however long it takes, 10 minutes or so, and to check on them all. And it's good to have a way to automatically do that twice a day. The cattle will drink about 200 gallons. So we have 34 head now, and they'll drink about 200 gallons of water a day. How much water uh, a head of cattle drinks is highly dependent. When they're on spring forage, they drink almost nothing because they're getting so much moisture out of the grass that they're eating. But in the wintertime, when they're eating dry hay, their water consumption really goes up. I don't have a problem with this freezing in the winter because the cattle drink it fast enough where the water doesn't have a chance to freeze. Sometimes ice will build up on the outside of it, but most of that will remelt when I refill it. If it gets really cold, we have an extended stretch of, of cold weather, I'll put a, a floating tank heater in this tank to keep it from freezing up. I'm gonna head in for lunch and I wanna show you something while I'm inside. This is called a sous vide cooker and it's just a water bath cook. Here, I'll, sh I'll take it off and show you. So this pot is filled with water and in this bag I have a chuck roast and I'm cooking this for 24 hours at 130 degrees and that held at that temperature for that long really makes the meat tender and this is really great for grass-fed beef which is a little bit trickier to cook than normal grain finished beef and it's especially good for this heifer beef that we've had that has less fat than a steer would normally have so I'm letting this cook if I can get this back on here this automatically circulates the water and holds it at temperature and when it's ready We'll come back and open it up and sear it and you can see what it looks like. Well, I guess it's time to head out into the winter pasture and open the gate and call them in. 27, 28, 29. I'm pacing off this winter pasture to let you know how big it is. I never measured it before. 31, 32, 33. According to my rough one yard pace, it is about 300 feet this way and 150 feet this way. A lot of people have asked, so I thought I'd settle that. Well, the only customer I got right now is Orden standing here. I'm gonna go ahead and open things up. They know what's coming. They're all coming up the laneway here. Well, I got no other takers. I'm gonna have to go out and get them. Well, come on, you lazy bones. Let's go. Come on, cows. Go on. Always gotta pull them in a straight line through the gate and then around the corner here. Come on, cows. Come on, cows. Oh, come on, guys. Come on, I got good stuff for you. Lots to eat. Well, you guys are being more reluctant than usual. You'd rather stand and bellyache than walk. Come on, cows! My God! Come on, guys! We'll try this. Come on, cows! Let's go, guys! Here we go. The calves are bringing up the rear. That's everybody. All I got to do now is close the gate. And they're in for the winter. There we go. Oh, where'd everybody go? I think they went in the barn. Oh, we got a few left out here nibbling at the grass. The grass in here ain't nothing special. This is an exercise and sunlight yard more than a grazing pasture. Which leads me to telling y'all about how we handle our cattle in the winter. And I'll do that in a minute. Hey guys. Oh, they've already come in here to check things out. And nibble on some hay. Our winter cattle pen in the old pole barn here is two bays. Each bay is 16 foot wide by 36 feet long, which gives us a total of 32 foot by 36 feet for these guys to have a shelter. They can come in and out the back door there whenever they want and access the winter pasture. 
We feed hay on both sides through these feeder panels and we put one round bale on this side and one round bale over on the other side so they can eat from both sides. Hey buddy, you're always playful. You don't come and see me. You always come and see me. How are you doing? Titus does too. The cattle will be in this winter pasture in the barn for five months now, or about 150 days, till sometime in April when they go back out. And during that time, they'll eat about 80,000 pounds of hay, or 40 tons of hay, which translates to about 75 to 100 of the four by five bales that I've got stored in the barn. Nope, now they're deciding to go back in. Gotta check everything out. You are a nice looking cow, Sally. Of course you're camera shy. Yes, you can go in, there's stuff to eat in there. You can go into 2007, and you too. I want to talk about the ways you can feed hay to cattle here for a minute in the winter time. There's basically three main ways. Number one is you put a bale ring in the field like we have out in our summer pasture in the grove and you feed the hay to the cattle outdoors and you move the bale ring around once in a while because they waste some of the hay and that way you kind of spread that residue around. The second way is to unroll bales in the field. So take different spots in your fields and unroll the bales and then the cattle can eat the hay off the ground and whatever gets left helps the soil fertility. The third way, is, which is the way that we do it, is to feed hay indoors. And I'm a big believer in feeding hay indoors. Number one, because I can't even hardly get out in the fields for a good part of the winter. It snows a lot here and the drifts can be three foot high or more and getting through them with a tractor to unroll bales in the field is not easy and plus I'm leaving a, a rut trail wherever I do it and we make hay off of the same field so it makes sense for us to pull the cattle off the fields entirely to keep the field smooth and non-rutted up and feed the hay indoors. The other thing is that hay is dear to me. Hay is expensive around here and sometimes hard to find. I paid $40 a bale for this hay that I'm feeding now because we don't have enough of our own hay to get our herd through the winter. So I want to waste as little as possible. And I found that by feeding in hay, hay indoors, I get a lot less weather waste. In other words, the hay getting rained and snowed on and a percentage of it spoiling because of that while it's in the feeder ring. And I get very little. The, hay, the cows will pull some hay through the feeder panels and they wind up kind of self-bedding themselves by the feeder panels. But it's much less waste than I would have from them pulling it out onto the muddy or wet ground via feeder ring. So it makes sense for us. And the final reason I like to pay in, feed hay inside is because that way I can capture the nutrients to spread back on my fields. And let me explain that. By feeding in the barn, I'm capturing most of the manure in the barn. And manure to me is a very valuable resource when composted. So if I capture it in the barn there, I have the ability to control how it's spread throughout my land via scooping it up and spreading it after it composts. Now, a full-grown cow of, of our breed will poop about 60 pounds of manure a day and will pee about three gallons of urine. And via the bedding pack I build in that barn, most of that will get captured. Most of the pooping and peeing that a cow does is done where they eat, which is probably not a good thing, but I can catch that and pile it and use it as a later resource to increase my soil fertility. In five months, this herd will drop about 150,000 pounds of manure in the barn, or 75 tons. And that's not even including the weight of the urine that gets soaked up by the bedding and the weight of the bedding itself. That's a lot of manure to deal with. Hey, Orden. Uh, bulls always need attention. There you go, bud. <laughs> now, there are pros and cons to the way that I handle manure. The, the big con is it takes fossil fuel. It takes me diesel and gasoline to move that manure around and compost it and then spread it on the field. And you might say, well, why don't you just have the cow spread it on the field? There's a lot to be gained through collecting up the manure and composting it. So if a, if a cow poops raw manure on the field, a good percentage of the, the nutrients for the soil in that manure is lost to the atmosphere. And in the wintertime, that manure will sit there and really not decompose very much at all because the temperature is cold. Oh, here comes Titus to see me. Hi, Titus. 
But the biggest pro is if I collect that manure in the barn, that bedding pack will actually start to compost in place. It'll heat up and provide some warmth to the cows as they lay on top of that bedding pack. And via composting, the nutrients that might escape to the atmosphere if it were just dropped on the field as raw manure, get locked up into the compost pile. And so in the end, I have more nutrients to work with rather than whether if the cows were just out pooping on the fields. It does take more work though. I mean, I have to clean out this barn three or four times in the winter and I have to pile a hoarding and I have to pile the compost over there and I have to let it cook for a season. And then the next spring I go and spread it. Another great advantage to doing it this way is I can choose how much and where to put the manure. So on my one field that's not fenced, it's dedicated to hay, I can put manure over there to replenish the nutrients there. If I have fields that look like they require more attention than others, like this poultry field over here is really in need of a good uh, dose of Viagra of, of composted manure, I can focus my manure application there. So it has its pros and cons, but in the end for me, it makes sense. Doc, my old buddy, how are you doing? You're my old buddy. Yes, you are. You and I play games, don't we? We play games. First we start with this. Well, that wasn't very nice. Doc! Bullies. I guess in the end, as I always say, Every farm is different. You have to do what works for you. And I think a danger starting out farming is to just carbon copy what somebody else is doing without knowing how your land and your climate and the animals you're raising can all work together in the best way. So people will argue to no end about the best way to feed hay in the winter. And that's because all farms are different. And what works best for you might not work best for another person. <laughs> <laughs> the little guy, he saw me and took off. He is a challenge to make friends with. Orton, you are severely confused. That is a boy, not a girl. Your sniffing isn't going to do anything. I guess the other thing about feeding hay that is pretty important to me is to keep it good instead of letting it spoil outside. So. We store our round bales inside instead of outside because it reduces spoilage. And here it all is in here. We got to get out a bale and bring it down to the barn to feed to the cattle. Looks like we got some customers. One of Titus's favorite activities is to headbutt a new bale. And scare other cows away. And I can't forget, I gotta bring the mineral feeder over from the grove here, which has got salt blocks or mineral blocks in it right now because Titus gets pretty savage with this during breeding season. So I put salt blocks in it. And they all gotta come check it out, see what's in it. Before I head inside for dinner, I almost forgot there's one other very important thing that I wanted to show you. And that is that our sow red here, red, pose for the camera is very, very close to having piglets. Her udders are filling up. And for those of you that weren't around the last time Red had piglets, she is an awesome mom. She lets me climb right in here with her, check out her piglets. She rarely, if ever, steps on a piglet. She's just the best mom we've ever had, aren't you, Red? And expect that moms always get a scratch in the middle of the back. Yeah. Okay. 
course, we always just hope that it won't be too cold when they're born, but Red is really good at taking care of her piglets, and when her piglets are born, they're really lively. So they get around, we don't worry about them very much. Just about time, lady. Itches for mom are very important. You wanna give the camera a sniff? Yeah. Give me a sniff. You're a good mom. Well, it's almost time to eat dinner, so I'm gonna take my roast out of my sous vide cooker and we'll just turn it off here. And pull the bag out. See how juicy it keeps it? Cause nothing can escape from it. I took the roast out of the bag and drained the juice out, which I always feel a little bad about doing because that juice is good stuff. Put it on a plate and I'm going to let it sit here for a little bit so that the temperature comes down a little bit and then I'm going to sear it in a pan. When I put it in the bag, I put some Montreal steak seasoning in with it. I just sprinkled some in there and it cooked around with the juices and it gives it a nice spice. So we'll let it rest and then sear it. Cast iron fry pan really hot and toss a big slab of butter in and sear the roast. Now this is called a reverse sear because I'm searing it after I cooked it. And I just want to put a nice crust on it. We'll leave it there for about a minute and a half or so and then we'll turn it around. Flip it over. Now we can give it the old taste test. We eat this more like a steak than a roast. 130 degrees is medium rare. Now you can set the sous vide higher. This is just the way we like our meat. Everybody likes their meat cooked differently, but this is the way we like it. It's nice and tender and it doesn't have that chuck roasty kind of gooeyness. Which I appreciate. And that's it with a sous vide cooker, which I think they run around $100. It's easy to do this kind of stuff and it makes tough meat really delicious. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next time.